Mutual aid work is important for meeting people's survival rate needs right now and for mobilizing hundreds of millions of people to join struggles for justice and liberation. Most people newly fired up about injustice are eager to work on the conditions happening to them or to people they care about. Mutual aid projects are the on-ramp for people to get to work right away on things they feel urgent about, plug into social movements where they can learn more about things they are not yet mad about, and build new solidarities. This section of this book is for people who want to start mutual aid projects or who are already in them and want to intentionally build group cultures and structures that will help the work flourish. Chapter four describes some of the larger political pitfalls of mutual aid groups, and chapter five turns to the nitty gritty, providing tools for addressing common obstacles in mutual aid work. This section includes things groups can do to address conflict and avoid slipping into charity model or business model practices, as well as ideas for things individuals within groups can do to expand their own capacity to do this work with as much compassion and care as possible, according to our principles. Chapter 4. Some Dangers and Pitfalls of Mutual Aid Even while they explicitly work to reject the charity model, Mutual aid projects can slip into some of the well-worn grooves of that model if we don't root deeply in our principles and practice careful discernment. Mutual aid groups face four dangerous tendencies. Dividing people into those who are deserving and undeserving of help. Practicing saviorism. Being co-opted and collaborating with efforts to eliminate public infrastructure and replace it with private enterprise and volunteerism. Deservingness hierarchies. People start mutual aid projects because existing programs or other services are not meeting people's needs and are often leaving out particular groups of vulnerable people. The notorious failures of the Federal Emergency Management Act, FEMA, in the face of disaster are a good example. The 2018 campfire in California was the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in the state's history, the worst wildfire in the United States in a century, and the most expensive natural disaster in the world that year. At least 85 people were killed in the fire, over 18,800 structures were destroyed, 52,000 people were evacuated, and the total damage was estimated at $16.5 billion. A tent city of people displaced by the fire emerged in a Walmart parking lot in Chico, California. In the days following the fire, as displaced people with more resources began to leave the tent city because they could afford to find new housing or stay with family or friends, city officials and media portrayed the people that remained as ordinary homeless and itinerant people who were undeserving of help rather than as sympathetic fire survivors. The hierarchy of deservingness is built into FEMA's eligibility process, which excludes people who cannot confirm an address before the disaster, such as homeless people or people living in poor communities where individual dwellings are sometimes not given an individual mailing address. The distinction between deserving and undeserving disaster survivors rests on the ideas, idea that suddenly displaced renters and homeowners are sympathetic victims while people who are already displaced by the ordinary disasters of capitalism and are especially vulnerable after an acute disaster like a storm or fire are blameworthy and do not deserve aid. As I argued above, state and nonprofit disaster recovery and social service models generally work to stabilize the existing distribution of wealth, not transform it. So it makes sense that they provide little or nothing to the poorest people. After disasters like Hurricanes Sandy and Katrina, the federal government offered loans to homeowners and business owners, and smaller loans to renters for replacing personal property. Only those who were deemed to be creditworthy could qualify, and many of those who qualified still never saw a penny. People in crisis are unlikely to be helped by having more debt, but putting them in debt does make money for banks reaping in the interest.
Similarly, during the initial COVID-19 outbreak in the United States, the federal government offered loans for businesses suffering economic losses. Almost immediately, stories broke about how giant corporations like Shake Shack and Potbelly received millions while small businesses owned by people of color received the least. Among individual workers, those with the most precarious jobs were cut out of unemployment benefits and the stimulus checks that were supposed to provide relief. Undocumented people were ineligible for relief. Disaster relief and poor relief are designed to uphold and worsen inequalities. Deservingness narratives justify those designs. Even though mutual aid projects often emerge because of an awareness of how relief programs ex exclude people marked undeserving or ineligible, mutual aid groups are still sometimes set up in their own problematic deservingness hierarchies. For example, mutual aid, aid projects replicate moralizing eligibility frameworks when they require sobriety, exclude people with certain types of convictions, only include families with children, or stigmatize and include, exclude people with psychiatric disabilities for not fitting behavioral norms. In his book, Gay, Inc., The Nonprofitization of Queer Politics, Merle Bean tells the story of a Minneapolis group founded by queer and trans youth to support the community. As the group formalized and got funding, it diverged from its initial mission and commitment to youth governance and became dominated by adults. The group began to work with the local police to check warrants for youth who came to the drop-in space. This functionally excluded criminalized youth, disproportionately youth of color, from the space and endangered people who came seeking help, turning what had been a mutual aid group into an extension of the local police department. When mutual aid projects make more stigmatized people ineligible for what they are offering, they replicate the charity model. The charity model often ties aid and criminalization together, determining who gets help and who gets put away, as we can see in this account from a mutual aid disaster relief MADR participant. After Hurricane Irma, a local sheriff announced that if you go to a shelter for Irma and you have a warrant, we'll gladly ex escort you to the safe and secure shelter called the Polk County Jail. This essentially weaponizes aid against the most vulnerable and puts numerous lives in danger. There is always a shocking number of guns that show up after a disaster. A dehydrated child without access to electricity or air conditioning in the blazing Florida or Texas or Puerto Rico sun needs somebody carrying Pedialyte, not an M16. Saviorism and Paternalism Mutual aid projects must also be wary of saviorism, self-congratulation, and paternalism. Populations facing crisis are cast as in need of saving, and their saviors are encouraged to use their presumed superiority to make over these people and places, replacing old, dysfunctional ways of being with smarter, more profitable, and more moral ones. In the wake of Hurricane Katrina, politicians, nonprofiteers, celebrity philanthropists, and corporations conspired to remake the city of New Orleans and the people in it by implementing devastating innovations that eliminated public housing, permanently displaced black residents, privatized schools, and destroyed public health infrastructure. After storms, floods, and fires, there is often this kind of push to rebuild in ways that center the plans and dreams of elites and do real harm to the populations who have lost the most. Paternalism is also visible in programs within welfare and criminal punishment systems that force criminalized people and people seeking welfare benefits to take parenting classes, budgeting classes, and anger management seminars. The idea that those giving aid need to fix people who are in need is based on the notion that people's poverty and marginalization is not a systemic problem, but is caused by their own personal shortcomings. This also implies that those who provide aid are superior. Mutual aid projects and their individual participants must actively resist savior narratives. These ideas are so pervasive that even those who have a systemic analysis of vulnerability still sometimes fall into the trap. 
Most mutual aid projects benefit from an explicit ongoing effort to build shared analysis among participants about the harms of saviorism and the necessary necessity of self-determination for people in crisis. Co-optation. For decades, politicians have combined attacks on public infrastructure and public services with an endorsement of privatization and volunteerism. As public services are cut, politicians push for already inadequate social safety nets to be replaced by family and church, implying that those who fail to belong to either deserve abandonment. Alongside the destruction of public welfare, public-private partnerships are celebrated and bolstered by the fiction that everything from hospitals to prisons to city governments should be run like a business. The, the prevailing myth is that business models are more efficient. The truth is that making everything profit-centered, as we've seen with our healthcare system, actually degrades the care that people experience, receive, as businesses sh seek short-term gains at any expense. A cultural narrative about social justice entrepreneurship has also emerged in recent decades, suggesting that people should not fight for justice, but rather invent and patent new ways of managing poor people and social problems. One example of this kind of entrepreneurship that has received media fanfare is Samaritan and other smartphone apps that coordinate digital donations to homeless people in ways that ensure restrictions on how they can use the cash. These apps are more focused on the experience of the giver rather than on the person in need of aid and are designed to make the giver more comfortable by knowing their donation can only be used at local partner businesses or if the homeless person's counselor authorizes it for a specific purpose like rent. This is typical of the kind of innovation that the social justice entrepreneurship model celebrates. It embraces the idea of paternalism central to the charity model focuses aid on making donors feel good and has no connection to work that aims to get to the root causes of the problem. In fact, it is being developed by the same tech industry that has gentrified cities and increased housing insecurity. In this atmosphere, mutual aid projects have to work hard to remain oppositional to the status quo and cultivate resistance rather than becoming complementary to privatization. In the wake of Hurricane Harvey in 2017, corporate media new news stories of boat owners volunteering to make rescues followed, by, followed this script, neither criticizing government failures to rescue people nor interrogating the cause of worsening hurricanes and whom they most endangered. That is, the media stories of individual heroes hid the social and political conditions producing the crisis. Politicians and CEOs who fantasize about a world where nothing is guaranteed and most people are desperate and easily exploited love the idea of volunteerism replacing a social safety net. If we don't design mutual aid projects with care, we can fight, fit right into this conservative dream, becoming the people who can barely hold the threads of a survivable world together while the 1% extracts more and more while heroizing individual volunteers. We can see this struggle to resist co-optation in the work of mutual aid projects that support people who have been criminalized. Programs that divert some of the arrestees from the criminal system to social services or drug treatment, or that provide mediation between people who have done harm and those that they have harmed as an alternative to the criminal legal process, can keep people out of jail or prison. However, they can also become non-disruptive disruptive adjuncts to, the, to carceral control as they professionalize and become funded and shaped by police and courts. In Seattle, for example, throughout a seven-year fight to stop the building of a new youth jail, public officials have relentlessly used the small diversion programs run primarily by people of color, which receive minimal amounts of public funding, as cover to argue that King County has already addressed concerns about youth incarceration through progressive work with community partners. They have gone so far as to co-opt the ideas of the youth jail opponents, passing legisl legislation stating that the city and county are committed to zero youth detention.
Meanwhile, the county build, built a youth jail for hundreds of millions of dollars. This story of a local government co-opting the message of the radical opposition and showcasing grassroots community-initiated programs to legitimize expansion of the racist infrastructure of state violence is chilling and highlights the thorny terrain of co-optation that mutual aid projects must navigate. Mutual aid projects may appear to overlap with privatization and volunteerism in that participants critique certain social service models and believe that voluntary participation in care and crisis work is necessary. But the critiques of public safety nets made by mutual aid project participants are not the same as those of neoliberal politicians and corporations who tout volunteerism. Mutual aid projects emerge because public services are exclusive, insufficient, punitive, and criminalizing. Neoliberals take aim at public services in order to further concentrate wealth and in doing so exacerbate material inequality and violence. Mutual aid projects seek to radically redistribute care and well-being as part of larger movements that work to dismantle the systems that concentrate wealth in the hands of the 1%. The difference between neoliberal projects and mutual aid approaches is well illustrated when we compare the privatization of fire services with the work of the Oakland Power Projects, which seeks to build an alternative to calling 911. Increasingly, public firefighting services are inadequate and are facing further cuts, all in the midst of cli climate change induced fires. Meanwhile, the private firefighting business is growing, with wealthy homeowners paying for private fire services to come seal their homes, spray fire retardants on the premises, and put owners in five-star hotels while less affluent people watch their homes burn, struggle in shelters, and fight FEMA for basic benefits. Fire profiteers aim to create a context in which only those who can pay get help or protection in the case of a fire which means fires will be more deadly, the rich will get richer, and the poor will get poorer. In contrast, the OPP emerged out of anti-police and anti-prison movement groups, who observed that when people call 911 for emergency medical help, the police also come, hurting and sometimes killing those who called for help. In response, the OPP works to train people in communities impacted by police violence to provide emergency medical care for gunshot wounds, chronic health problems like diabetes and mental health crises. If people can take care of each other, then they can avoid calling 911 and avoid a confrontation with the police. This strategy is part of a broader is part of broader work to dismantle policing and criminalization, and it works to both meet immediate needs and mobilize people to build an alternative infrastructure for crisis response guided by a shared commitment to ending racist police violence and medical neglect. Note that, although the OPP and private firefighting both provide an alternative to inadequate public services, they are not the same at all. Instead of profiting and only serving those who can pay, the OPP's programs build new ways of responding that allow those on the bottom to work together to meet survival needs, while dismantling racist infrastructure. Many powerful lessons about co-optation come out of the feminist movement against domestic violence. That movement started with mutual aid projects, such as volunteer-run shelters for violence survivors and defense campaigns for women criminalized for killing their abuser or attacker. Unfortunately, the anti-domestic violence movement emerged at the same time that criminalization was about to balloon in the United States. The mass uprisings of the 1960s and 70s brought a huge crisis of legitimacy to policing, with Black liberation, anti-racist, feminist, queer, and indigenous movements protesting and exposing police violence. In response, U.S. law enforcement worked hard to repair its public image, doing things like hiring cops of color, creating new police roles in schools through initiatives like the D.A.R.E. program and creating programs and campaigns to portray the police as the protectors of women and children. Towards this end, law enforcement sought out alliances with the emerging anti-domestic violence movement, supporting new laws that increased punishment for gender-based violence and providing money for groups willing to cooperate with police. 
this drastically changed the anti-domestic violence movement. It shifted from centering volunteer-based grassroots mutual aid projects to emphasizing larger nonprofits often run by white people with advanced degrees. These groups increasingly towed the line of a pro-police message and advocated for increased criminalization, meanwhile taking on charity model approaches that treated people seeking help in punitive and paternalizing ways. This shift increased the criminalization of communities of color, made the services less accessible to the most vulnerable survivors of violence, and provided good, good public relations for the police, prosecutors, and the courts. Notably, these co-optive approaches also failed to reduce gender-based violence. Research has shown that pro-criminalization policy reforms that became popular in this period, like mandatory arrest laws requiring police to make arrests during domestic violence calls, resulted in the arrests of abuse survivors, especially if they were queer, trans, disabled, or people of color. This is a sobering story of how co-optation can undermine our efforts to meet survival needs and cause us to contribute to legitimize or legitimizing or expanding the very systems that are harming us. At the same time, these events also produced a vibrant resistance from which we can learn much in developing mutual aid work that resists co-optation. Women of color, working class and immigrant feminists, and feminists with disabilities have powerfully resisted the shift towards criminalization in the movement against gender violence. They have created mutual aid projects to address harm and violence that refuse to collaborate with police. This work is often called community accountability or transformative justice. It includes many innovative strategies developed in mutual aid groups. Drawing on lessons from years of experience, Creative Interventions authored a 600-page guide on how to address sexual violence and family violence through community support and problem solving. Generation 5 and the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective have designed approaches to addressing child sexual abuse that aim to get to the root causes and stop it, rather than just criminalizing the small percentage of people who get caught. Hundreds of local groups like Philly Stands Up and For Crying Out Loud have developed processes for supporting survivors of violence and confronting harm doers, working with them to figure out what they need to never in inflict the harm again. These processes sometimes last several years with the community members providing harm doers with support for their sobriety, mental health and housing needs, deepening understanding of their behaviors and their beliefs about gender and sexuality, and doing whatever else they need to stop the behavior. The goal of this kind of work is to do the things that the criminal punishment approaches fail to do. Give the survivor support to heal, give the harm doer whatever they need to stop the behavior, and assess how community norms can change to decrease the likelihood of harm in general such as by providing healthy relationship skills training, addressing a culture of substance misuse, and changing community ideas about sexuality and gender. The Safe Outside the System Collective, a part of the Audre Lorde project in New York City, has engaged a variety of tactics to address violence against queer and trans people of color, including police violence. One strategy it developed was building relationships with people working in businesses in a Brooklyn neighborhood where violence often occurred. Asking those bodega cashiers, restaurant staff, and other workers to provide a place for people to run for help if something is happening on the street, a place that pledges to not call the police. This community-wide work of building long-term relationships increased those people's preparedness for helping people in need and de-escalating situations which increased safety in the neighborhood. Some transformative justice work is focused on prevention and some is focused on providing support after something happens. Both are mutual aid approaches since they address immediate survival needs with a recognition that the systems that are supposed to guarantee safety, the cops, prosecutors, and courts, fail to do so and actually make things worse. These mutual aid projects work to build a new world where people create safety through community building 
and support each other to stop harmful behavior through connection rather than through caging. These feminist activists and groups with an anti-police, anti-violence politic also developed much of the analysis that informs this book. They identified how the system of non-profitization and pressure from funders were pushing anti-violence work towards criminalization, how mutual aid approaches were undermined when domestic violence shelters and hotlines became more like social services, and how the co-optation of anti-violence work undermined solidarity, further endangering communities most targeted by police. Their wisdom can guide us in building successful groups and movements and in resisting co-optation. Characteristics of mutual aid versus charity. Mutual aid projects depart from the charity model in crucial ways. Most mutual aid projects are volunteer-based and avoid the careerism, business approach, and charity model of nonprofits. Mutual aid projects strive to include lots of people rather than just a few people who have been declared experts or professionals. If we want to provide survival support to as many people as possible and mobilize as many people as possible for root causes change, we need to let a lot of people do the work and make decisions about the work together, rather than bottlenecking the process with hierarchies that let only a few people lead. Despite these important goals, avoiding the pitfalls of co-optation, deservingness, hierarchies, saviorism, and disconnect from the root causes work requires constant vigilance. The last half century of social movement history is full of examples of mutual aid groups that, under pressure from law enforcement, funders, and culture, transformed into charity or social service groups and lost much of their transformative capacity. Here are some guiding questions for mutual aid groups trying to avoid these dangers and pitfalls. Who controls our project? Who makes decisions about what we do? Does any of the funding we receive come with strings attached that limit who we help or how we help? Do any of our guidelines about who can participate in our work cut out stigmatized and vulnerable people? What is our relationship to law enforcement? How do we introduce new people in our group to our approach to law enforcement? While there is no single correct model for a mutual aid group, being aware of general tendencies that distinguish mutual aid from other projects can help groups make thoughtful decisions and maintain their integrity and effectiveness. To help us think through where things can get slippery, the chart below tracks characteristics within mutual aid groups against those of groups working in the charity model. It may be a good discussion prompt for a mutual aid group to clarify shared values or find areas of agreement and disagreement or desire for further inquiry.